This video is about choosing an appropriate test to use. Let's start on the categorical side of our topic organizer. Um, so let's say that we just have one categorical variable. Um, there are two different tests that we've learned for this. Um, one is a one proportion Z test. So that was the first hypothesis test we learned. Um, and the other one is a chi-squared goodness of fit test. So the difference between these two is that a one proportion Z test um, only works for a binary variable, so success and failure. A chi-square goodness of fit test allows you to have more than two categories. The other chi-squared test that we've learned is a chi-squared test of independence, and this is for looking at the relationship between two categorical variables. On the quantitative side, if you just have one quantitative variable, um, you're going to use a one-sample t-test for that. Um, if you have a quantitative response, but a categorical explanatory variable, in other words, your explanatory variable is which group you're in, um, then that's going to be a two-sample t-test. So you still have a quantitative response, um, but you're trying to compare two groups. So this would be if you had independent groups. Um, you could also have a t-test for paired data. So that would be instead of having two separate groups, um, having something like before and after data, um, two measurements that were paired up somehow. And then the last one is if you have the relationship between two quantitative variables, um, that's going to be a t-test, and this is regression, so it would be t-test for the regression slope. So notice when the response variable is categorical, you're always going to use z or chi-square, um, with z being the appropriate choice for one binary variable. And then when the response variable is quantitative, you're going to use t. There is one exception to this, um, which is if the population parameters are given, then you're going to use the normal distribution even if the data are quantitative. So this happens in probability questions um, where you may be told specifically that a distribution of individuals has a normal distribution. So in that case, if it tells you that they have a normal distribution, um, then you'll use that distribution calculator. So for this exercise, I just want you to think about which distribution calculator you would use. Um, so go ahead and pause the video, read these four scenarios, um, and decide which distribution calculator is appropriate. So the first one asks about the relationship between sodium content and number of calories. So those are both quantitative variables. Um, you would be dealing with a regression slope. And to calculate the confidence interval, specifically to get the critical value T star, you would need to use the T distribution calculator. The second one is one of those probability questions we were talking about. So notice that it's talking about the weight of the steer can be described by a normal model. So it tells us that these individual weights have a normal distribution. So even though it's quantitative, for this one we would use the normal distribution calculator. The next one asks, is there an association between class year and preferred study spot? Both of those are categorical variables. Um, so this would be a chi-squared test. Specifically, it would be a chi-squared test of independence. And then the last one, a manager of a bakery reports that the average value of customer transactions is greater than $10, and we want to test her claim. So we're looking at the value of customer transactions. Um, that's a quantitative variable, and so this is going to be a t-test, a one-sample t-test. So we've talked about deciding which distribution calculator to use. How do you decide which formula to use? Um, so there's two basic things that we're going to calculate with formulas, um, the test statistic or the confidence interval. Um, so the test statistic has that general formula, a sample statistic minus the null hypothesis value divided by the standard error, um, or it could be a chi-squared statistic. So remember, chi-squared has a specific use. It's when you're looking at categorical data um, so it could be a single variable that has more than two categories, or it could be the relationship between two categorical variables. So for either of these formulas, you're going to have to pick a sample statistic to plug in, um, and that depends on what type of data you have. So it could be a sample proportion, it could be a sample mean, or it could be a sample slope. Um, and you'll also have to choose a standard error formula. Um, so these are given on your reference sheet. Um, the standard error for p hat and the standard error for y bar, the sample mean. Um, and then sometimes you'll have to pull it from the output. So if you were looking at the standard error of the slope, um, that would come from the circle value on the jump output. 
And one other set of formulas I wanted to show you on the reference sheet, um, these that start with n, n equals, um, those are formulas for calculating the necessary sample size. So if it gives you a margin of error and says how large should the sample size be to achieve that margin of error, that's when you're going to use one of these two formulas. The one on the left is for categorical data and the one on the right is for quantitative data. Something that's not listed on your reference sheet are the conditions for inference. Um, but these kind of go with what we've talked about already. So when you talk about a one proportion Z test, um, proportion, we symbolize that with P. Um, so there's going to be a P involved in our conditions here. N times P is greater than 10, and N times 1 minus P is also greater than 10. For a chi-squared test, notice that the chi-squared statistic has observed and expected counts in it. Um, your conditions are going to be in terms of the expected counts. So specifically, your expected counts all need to be at least five. The t-test for means, that's the one that's just um, the sample size has to be at least 30. Or the other way to meet this one is that the distribution could be approximately normal. So there you would need to plot your data um, and see if it looks approximately normal. The ones for the slope are a little bit different. Um, here we're going to use um, some residual plots and we're going to check for linearity constant variance, and normality of the residuals. All right, so now that we've talked about the basics of choosing an inference procedure and checking conditions, um, let's take a second to focus on the ones that are most commonly missed. Um, so people tend to have trouble telling the difference between a two-sample t-test and a paired t-test. So in this example of a two-sample t-test, we're comparing the sales in Atlanta to the sales in Miami. So these are two different offices. These are two independent samples, and the individuals, the cases in one group, aren't related to the cases in the other group. There's no obvious way to pair up people in Atlanta with a doppelganger in Miami. These are totally separate groups. Compare that to a paired t-test. So with a paired t-test, a lot of times you have one sample um, with two measurements per case. So like here, we have for each person two different measurements, one before training and one after training, and we're calculating the difference each time. So anytime there's an obvious way that the data come in pairs that you need to keep the two measurements matched up, that's going to be a paired t-test. So I've got three more examples here. Um, go ahead and pause the video and decide for each one whether you have independent groups or paired data. All right, if we look at the first one, this is going to be paired data because each customer is trying two different recipes. Um, and it would be important to keep their um, numbers matched up, right? Maybe some customers just like carrot cake cookies more than others. So their ratings of both recipes are going to be higher or lower. Um, so that would be paired data. Um, the second one, this is actually also paired data. Um, and the reason for that is because the data still come in pairs even though it's not two measurements per person, um, we have a man and a woman that are living together. So if you think about how much people spend on haircuts, if um, one of them has the financial means to spend a lot of money on the haircut, um, then there's a great chance that the other one does too, right? So we're sort of controlling for the person's um, financial situation or the couple's financial situation and just looking at whether men or women spend more. Okay. And then the last one, this is independent groups because the people in one section um, don't have anything to do with the people in the other section. There's no obvious way to match them up. Um, may not even be the same number of people in each group. Um, so even though they are being taught um, the same material, this is still independent groups. These are totally separate samples. And one more thing that people tend to find difficult is the difference between a chi-squared goodness of fit test and a chi-squared test of independence. And really the difference is just whether you have one variable or two. Um, so one way you can think about that is imagine the survey, right? When they sampled people and they gave out a survey, how many questions were on it? Did they ask each person one question? That would be a goodness of fit test. If they asked them two questions, that would be a test of independence. Um, you can also sort of look at how the statistical is question is phrased. So if it says, does a given model fit the data? Um, so you've got some values or maybe you're testing whether things are equally likely, um, then that would be goodness of fit. Whereas the test of independence is generally going to ask, is there a relationship or is there an association between the two variables? 
So I have an example of a chi-squared test here. Um, go ahead and pause the video and see if you can decide which type of test is appropriate. All right, so in this example, this is going to be a chi-squared goodness of fit test. And the reason for this is that we're starting off with population values that are known, right? The teacher knows what the distribution of majors should be in her class in the population. Um, but then at the study session, she wants to see if that matches up. So she gives a survey and the survey really only has one question on it, right? She asks the people who are at her study session, what is your major? And that's the only question. Right? So in this case, this would be a chi-square goodness of fit test, um, which is to see if the model, the population values, applies to the people at the study session.